Okay, everyone, thank you so much for uh, coming today to the uh, Screencasting for Beginners, Enhancing Your Online Classroom with Video Feedback webinar. We do have a humongous group. This is a record for Maryland Online's webinars. Uh, and I do ask that you keep yourselves muted if possible and put your questions into the chat. Uh, both Sarah and I will be monitoring the, the chat and try to get to all your questions. And if we don't, we'll try to answer them after the webinar. Um, there, the recording and the slides are going to be sent out, but they may not get to you today. It might be in the next day or so, um, as soon as we can get them all together and have Kathleen send them out to you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sarah Felber. He is a professor at the University of Maryland Global Campus and is in the writing across the curriculum program. He's also the co-editor of the Journal of College Reading and Learning and an excellent presenter. We have been fortunate to have her uh, do this webinar once before. Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy it. And after that, I'm going to say, Sarah, take it away. Oh, Sarah, I appear not. Everybody. Some of you with your cameras on, if you're comfortable with it, it's totally your choice. Um, and as Wendy mentioned, this is a repeat of a webinar that um, was conducted last year, but we thought that there might be a new audience for it this year because so many of us are now teaching online either for the first time or more or just uh, looking for ways to enhance what we do in our online teaching. So um, I wish I could go through every one of you and have your introductions and hear your story about why you're here and what you're hoping to gain. Um, since we have maybe a few too many people for that, um, I'm not going to, but um, what I would like to do is do a quick poll um, that asks you some of that. Um, so this, is where I this slide is where I was going to introduce myself, but I think Wendy already <laughs> did that plenty. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll to ask you about um, you <laughs> and um, what you're looking about, what, what you're looking for. Um, you should see the poll on your screen and you can go ahead and um, select options for the two questions. It's really cool from the presenter view when people are answering and you see the lines with like a graph changing as people put in their answers. I'll share these results with you in a moment. I see most people have voted. I'm going to give it a few more seconds and then I'll end the poll and show you the results. Okay. So, um, you could see, let's see, um, we have about a third of the attendees who are teaching online for the first time right now. Um, about another third who, um, who were teaching online before, but are now teaching online more. And then a little bit more, a little bit larger third, um, who were teaching online before and have had no change. Um, so I think that that is a good, uh, it gives me a good understanding of where everyone's coming from in terms of their experience with online teaching. Um, why are you interested in screencasting? I see, um, Almost half are looking for a more personal or multimedia way to provide feedback. 19% um, say they're tired of so much typing, which I can completely sympathize with. Um, and then the majority, um, almost 70% said they're curious about different things to do in the online classroom. And then a few of you have some other reasons. If you wanted to put the other reasons in the chat, if you wanted to share, you could do that. Um, I know that when I first started doing um, screencasting. It was because I was tired of so much typing, honestly. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I now find a lot of other benefits to it. 
but it really was to save my um, my hands and my wrists at the beginning. Um, so I'm, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to see if um, anybody's put anything in the chat, but I don't see it. Um, oh, okay, now I see it. But no, nobody telling the reasons for, uh, there are other reasons, that's fine. Um, okay, let's go ahead and talk about what is a screencast. So a screencast is, at the most basic level, a recording or a capture of um, what's happening on your screen along with your voice. So um, right now we're in a Zoom webinar and it's being recorded. And so although we might not think of this first when we think of a screencast, that would be a screencast because that recording would have what's going on on my screen as well as what's coming through my microphone. Um, but there's some other tools that are made specifically for screencasts, whereas what we're doing now, Zoom is primarily for an online meeting. Um, and so we'll look in a little bit, of, in a moment, at some of the different tools. Um, so as I mentioned, a, a screencast is essentially a recording of what's happening on the computer screen, along with some other things like your voice, um, optionally, maybe your video. Um, and I'd like to show you a couple of examples. This first example is, um, not feedback, but it is part of a video announcement in a class that I ran. And um, you can see from the, the previous screen here that um, it's got my screen capture and then in the bottom corner, it had my video. And I'm gonna play, play it. It's parts of the announcement spliced together. So you're gonna see where it kind of skips a little bit. I did that so that I didn't think we needed to watch the whole thing, but let's go ahead and watch this clip. Oh, and you know what? I just realized I need to set the um, my screen sharing so that you can hear it. So I'm going to fix that. All right, now you should be able to hear it. Hello, welcome to Writing 111, Introduction to Academic Writing 1. I'm Dr. Sarah Felber, your professor for the course, and I would like to welcome you and give you an orientation to our class. When you log, in, log into the class, you'll be on this front page, which has announcements. I will be posting an announcement typically each Monday. I would suggest you then head over to the content area because this is going to walk you through um, the content for the course. So um, that is the basics of you know what you can do with the screencast. You could see um, that as I did things on the screen, that came through in the video. It was just a recording of my screen. Um, in this case, where I clicked, you could see a yellow circle highlighting those um, those mouse clicks. And that's an option in a lot of screencasting tools to help call out those clicks. Um, I'm going to show you now another example. Um, and this one is actually paper feedback. Um, this is not a real student paper. It's something that I made up. but. Um, in this case, in the preview, you can see that there's some comments that I had already written on the paper. This is something I like to do before I give um, recorded paper feedback. Um, just go through the paper, make some notes about things that um, I want to talk about, or sometimes it's notes for the student because I might not talk about everything um, that I want to tell the student. And so I make those notes and then I go back and record a quick uh, feedback. And when I say quick, I would say that most of the time it's about five minutes. So I'm going to play just a clip of, of that for you. Hi, Jill. This is Dr. Falber. I hope you're doing well. I have some feedback for you on this draft of your paper on MOOCs. So you can see that I've written a few comments in the margins here, which you'll be able to read when I give you this file. But I wanted right now to go over some of the more general comments that I have about your approach to the assignment. So one thing I noticed is that you haven't inserted any citations to your sources yet. So whenever you have information that you got from a source, you're going to want to insert an in-text citation and also include that source at the end of the paper in your reference list. You could insert your in-text citation right at the end of the sentence or passage that has the information. So for example, um, when you're talking about the number of learners in MOOCs, you could cite a source where you found that out and put that in parentheses right here. Remember, we're using APA format, so you'll use the author and then the year. 
Okay, so that's the end of the clip. Um, hey, uh, Sarah, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. Could you just repeat again the, the name of the application you're using? Oh, I don't think I had mentioned it yet. This is oh. um, this application is Screencast-O-Matic, and um, we will be looking at it in in detail. Thank you. In, in a bit. Um, so in the in the feedback that you just saw, um, as you could see, um, I did start with some notes on the page, but then as I was speaking to the student, I was typing some things, and the student could see me adding um, adding those comments. So um, if you think about that student experience, um, she's not receiving a paper that's just covered in red marks. Instead, she's seeing her paper and um, seeing me where, as I'm adding some things and marking some things up. Um, so she has an understanding of what that's doing there. So how does this happen, right? That's what we all wanna know. And um, I've put up here just a few examples of the many tools that can be used to record screencasts. So there's actually many more tools than this, but I just wanted to give you some um, overview of some of the representative examples. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking in more detail at Screencast-O-Matic, which is the um, tool that I use to record the two screencasts that you just watched. So um, the reason that I choose to use Screencast-O-Matic and I recommend it is that it has a free version that's fairly robust. Um, the free version will allow users to record um, a single recording that goes up to 15 minutes. Um, and then I'm not sure if there's a limit on the number of recordings you can store with it, but I, I have never reached it if there is a limit. And um, it allows for free users to store those videos on the Screencast-O-Matic server which becomes important if you're making a lot of these videos because you're not gonna have much space on your computer to save tons and tons of videos. Um, there is also a paid version and I think it's about $15 a year. And what that does for you is it increases the possible recording time and it gives you some editing tools. Um, it also allows you to record computer audio. So if you think about the audio you heard on the um, videos we just watched, that was from my microphone. Um, but if I had, let's say, pulled up Spotify and played a song, it wouldn't have come through unless I, let's say, held my microphone up to the speaker. Um, but the paid version would allow you to record the computer audio. Um, Loom is another example of a screencasting tool. And um, this is one I've tried it a while ago. I haven't tried it recently, but um, at least when I used it, it was set up as Chrome extension, a Google Chrome extension. Um, so if you have any familiarity with, with extensions, it's just a small, um, not a full program that you download, but a small um, executable that adds a button to Google Chrome. Um, and it also, I believe, is free for educators and has maybe has some advanced features for educators. Um, it's a newer tool. It's not as established. And so I noticed there were a lot of changes as I was trying to use it. You know, they would constantly be changing the features. And that was a little bit uh, disruptive for me. Um, Camtasia is one that um, if you're looking to do some advanced editing, if you're looking to create more professional type videos, um, it allows for that. But it is rather expensive. Um, so for a beginner, it might not be the thing that you're looking for, but it's still something I thought I'd mention. And then Zoom is one that I added on here because as I mentioned, it's not a tool that we typically think of for screencasting. We typically think of it as a meeting tool, but um, a lot of uh, people might have access to a professional Zoom account through their employer. And so if you're looking for a tool that you already have access to, that might be it. Um, and if you do have access to a paid Zoom account through your employer, um, then that also would allow you to store videos online. Um, and a further thing it would allow you to do is if you're storing videos online with Zoom, then um, it's creating for you, and it can create for you an auto-generated transcript. Um, sometimes you might find it necessary with a video to have some kind of captioning or transcript. And so that's a great um, way to start is if, if it's auto automatically generated for you. Um, and so the way to make a screencast with Zoom would be start a meeting, share your screen, and make sure you're recording that meeting. Um, and then when people watch the recording, that's your screencast. 
So I'm going to stop for a minute and ask Wendy, are there any questions just in general about the range of tools or like what we've covered so far? We do have, um, we did have a couple people, by the way, who did mention um, what they were using, what, why they were here, um, which I can, a moment may have passed so we could talk about that. Uh, That's okay, I'd like, I'd like to hear it. Um, but I, I do, oh, okay, well, I'll, I can start with that. And uh, we have from uh, Deborah, uh, just trying to improve my skills with my screencasting, which I have used for some time. Um, and from Javier, I'm working on a mini media lab and have to learn the different ways to support the tools we have on the computers. And from Amy, I have experimented with some screencast programs, mainly Loom and Screencast-O-Matic, and some facets can be tough to learn. Um, and we do have a couple of um, questions. I, uh, very complimentary to the entire group because a lot of people are answering each other's questions. And so it's a lively conversation. And <laughs> it's very- um, Perfect. Uh, very good. Um, and but we'll start with uh, one from Kathy who asks uh, what you thought of Microsoft Teams. Teams? I'm, yeah. I'm not like a, I'm not a very experienced user of Teams. I have access to it, but I, it's not something that I can really speak on. Um, and is Microsoft Stream a viable option? Oh, Stream. Never tried it. I have no idea. Oh, that was a, that was a different <laughs> question. Well, there's so many see. tools with this, honestly, that. Um, uh, there's just so many screencasting tools that uh, I can certainly not claim to know about all of them. So, yeah, um, we do um, screen our presenters for brutal honesty. So, as you can tell, Sarah will not try to talk about that. <laughs> <She doesn't laughs> know it. Um, and then we we had a couple of things. Zoom transcripts can be edited um, that John wrote about uh, and. Are they ADA compliant, or is there help with making them ADA compliant? For transcripts? Um, well, they talk, yes. Actually, it looks like it's in reference to the Zoom transcripts, but I imagine for any tool. Um, so, you know, speaking from my level of knowledge, which certainly is not a legal level of ADA, but, um, but I think that if you have a, um, an accurate transcript or accurate captioning that would be compliant um, so that typically requires that if you have an automatic transcript you're starting with that you go through and edit it you want to add um, sometimes there's no punctuation or capitals or there might be errors in the words so um, depending on the level of accuracy you feel you require then editing is, is a good move and would get you closer to ADA compliance as far as I know um, okay then we had just two more quick questions one was uh, was the poll at the beginning a screen castomatic feature, but I can actually, that's actually a Zoom feature, correct? Yes. And um, I had a couple people ask how this would work in Canvas, if you know. In Canvas, okay, so I don't use Canvas. Um, so that might be a good thing for, for the um, attendees to help each other on. But um, I am assuming that in Canvas, there is um, there are ways to post videos. So what, what um, I would look for is the same way you would post, say, a YouTube video or any other online video would be the way that you would post um, something, a screencast that you stored on the cloud. When you store a screencast on the cloud, meaning it's stored online at the site, of, at screencast o -matic site or it's stored online by Zoom, it's accessed by a URL. So um, the same way that you would share any video that's accessed by a URL is how you would do that. Okay, well, I'll let you continue and we'll keep track of these questions. And like I said, if it turns out that your question is not uh, uh, captured in, in the discussion, we will um, try to get to those questions. And when I send out the recording and slides, maybe we have some answers for you in um, that transmittal email. Um, so I wanted to go through a, a couple of the ways, a few of the ways that you can use screencast videos. Um, as you know, we titled the webinar um, after using them for feedback, but you've already seen that um, you can use them for other things. For example, video announcements or, or online classroom tours. I do both of those in my classes. At the beginning of the class, I will walk through students through the online classroom, show them where to find things, how to do some basic functions. And then on a weekly basis, I will give them video announcements. I'm calling out some of the important things that we're doing that week. And on the video announcements, I do typically have that little inset with my camera so that students get some sort of FaceTime to see me um, at least once a week. 
Um, some of the other things that you can do are um, a document review. So it doesn't have to be um, video feedback, but it could be any kind of document. You know, maybe you want to analyze um, a document or point out things to your students on that document. You could do that. Um, in a more calculation oriented course, a math class or something, you could walk through calculations as long as you have some way to um, perform those on your screen. Um, maybe through a white, some sort of whiteboard program or whatever it is that you would do to um, set up calculations to show them on your screen. You can record that. Um, or a technical how-to. This is something I do a lot when either, let's say, students or colleagues or my mom <laughs> asks me how to do something on the computer. Um, I often find the easiest way is I say, okay, mom, I'm just going to show you. And I turn on my, my uh, screencast recorder and I do all the things that I show, show her. Okay, then you click here, then you click here. And I send her the link to the video. And um, the next thing I wanted to look at is just uh, briefly some of the research on screencast instruction and the effects that it may have in a classroom. Because, you know, as faculty members, if we're going to invest the time into learning how to do new tricks, we want to know that they're going to benefit our students. Um, so there has been um, a decent amount of research on this, and I wanted to show you some of the results from a few different fields. Um, so the first study that I wanted to highlight is from a statistics course. And um, these authors, Lloyd and Robertson, 2012, they showed, um, they compared a text and image-based tutorial with a screencast tutorial. So one that was um, text and still images versus recorded. And they found that the screencast tutorial on statistics resulted in better student performance overall. In the same year, 2012, in an engineering course, um, these authors looked at screencasts used to explain homework solutions and present mini lectures. And they found that that was beneficial to students um, increased performance on exam questions and on their course grades. They found that it was most beneficial to students with the greatest need. So students who had the lowest course grades prior to the use of these screencasts are the ones who saw the most benefit from it. Jumping up to 2016, um, in my field, composition, um, the author found that compared with written only feedback, a combination of written and screencast feedback led to improvements in all areas that, that they measured. So overall writing skill, content, organization, and structure. A combination of written and screen, screencast feedback could be something like what I showed you, where there's written notes on the screen, or you know, the, the written feedback could be in some other form. And then looking at documentation, um, this study just in 2018 found that students um, more successfully corrected their APA errors, errors after watching an instructional screencast compared to just using an APA manual. So across areas, across fields, we're finding that the screencasts are benefiting student learning. Students also say that they really like it. So if you're somebody who's tried this, hopefully you've heard the same that I've heard, is that students um, are communicating that they find it extremely beneficial. They are saying that compared to just getting written feedback, they feel less threatened and more supported by hearing the teacher's voice. Um, and that could go beyond just the voice. I mean, it could actually, I believe, go to even the kinds of feedback that we tend to give. Because I know that when we are typing feedback, at least when I'm typing feedback, the tendency is to say, all right, I need to point out to the student all these places where I see areas for improvement. I need to justify every point I took off on the rubric. And so there's a lot of critical feedback. And when I'm speaking, my um, instinct is to balance that better with positive reinforcement of the things that I think the student did well. Um, so the student is hearing me, sometimes seeing me, seeing that I'm a person and not just a bunch of red marks and hearing um, a balance of positive and negative. Students are also saying they have an easier time understanding the feedback when it is recorded than when it's only written. And that makes sense if you think about the multimedia nature of it, 
that um, they are able to match up what they see with what they hear. And so from a cognitive standpoint, um, it makes sense that they're processing it more effectively. And they're also saying that they sometimes watch these videos more than once, which I can verify by um, in Screencast-O-Matic, I can look at the statistics and see how many times a video has been watched. And I see that some people are watching them more than once. Um, there was actually one author who advocated for the use of screencast um, feedback as a replacement for face-to-face -face conferencing. Um, because this author was saying, some students like it better, they can watch it more than once, whereas the conference is over, it's over, right? Um, not all students had that preference, but um, some did. It also, um, doing the screencast feedback is going to benefit us as instructors. Um, for one thing, it is going to eventually save us time. We know that there's a learning curve, right? The first few times can take a while. Um, once you get into a groove, you have a routine and you know how, you, how to do this, it really can save time. I don't know too many people who can type faster or more efficiently than they can talk. Um, even if you're not talking fast, right? even if you're talking at a normal pace, that's generally going to be um, more content in a smaller amount of time than if you have to type it all up. And also, as I mentioned, saving your hands and your wrists, right? Um, especially if you're um, just coming into online teaching or if you've increased it a lot, those muscles aren't used to constant typing, right? Um, so being able to save some of that typing and communicate some of that verbally is gonna be a benefit. So the next, uh, the next portion of the webinar is where I'm going to show you actually how it happens, which I think is probably what a lot of you are really hoping to uh, come out with. And I have broken this down into four basic steps. So I'm gonna just um, present those four steps and then go back and demonstrate each of them in Screencast-O-Matic. I'll show you how I do each of these steps. In addition, I'm going to put um, in the chat, I'm going to put a URL that has it links you to an online handout that shows you each of these steps with um, images, with screenshots to walk you through it so that you can use that later. So let me actually um, grab that link and I will post it for you. Chat. Okay, hopefully that works. Oh, I, <laughs> I sent it to one person. Let's send it to everyone. That might be better. There we go. And I will put the screen sharing back on. All right, so the four basic steps are you choose your tool and get it ready, right? Um, that could be either a full download of a program or a web-based tool. And when I say web-based tool, I mean something like the Google Chrome extension that's just a small download and then launches from um, your web browser. And when we do Screencast-O-Matic actually has both. I'm going to show you the web-based version. Um, then I would suggest creating an account because that's going to let you store recordings um, online. Um, so, so a lot of these tools, you could use them without having an account, but you would have to save your videos on your computer. If you want to be able to go back and view them online, you need to have an account. Next, you're going to launch your tool. So open your program, press your web extension, whatever, and hit the record button. You're going to do whatever it is you need to do on your screen, make your video, then you're going to end the, end the video and save it. So if you save it online, then it will be accessed through a URL. If you save it as a video file on your computer, it'll be a large file, possibly large, depending on how long your video is, that you need to give people as an attachment. Um, so I think you know what my preference is. But um, those are the steps, right? It's pretty, pretty basic in terms of what, what the sequence of steps are that you have to do to accomplish this. So let's take a look, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to 
to split my screen here um, and show you how to do this. Um, can I confirm that you can see right now um, my split screen on the left, you see a, a browser on the right, you see the um, PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes. Excellent, okay. Um, okay, so first step, and as I mentioned, we're going to try this with Screencast-O-Matic. So the URL is screencastomatic.com. It has those dashes in it, but you can leave them out. It still works without the dashes. And um, you're going to create an account. And I already have one. You can see it's logged in here, but you would um, see a button there to create your account. And it's normal things to create an account. So you put in your email, you choose a password, and then I believe it sends you an email to verify the account. And at that point, you're ready to go. That's step one, done. Okay, step two, we're going to launch the tool and press record. Um, so to launch the um, online t recording tool, you're going to use um, this button, start recording for free, and then um, press launch free recorder. If for whatever reason you wanted to download the full program, that link is way at the bottom. They're not really promoting it too much, but download screen recorder. The, it, it's essentially the same recorder. It looks exactly the same, but instead of launching it from the Screencast-O-Matic web page, you would then launch it the same way you would open a program on your computer. So I'll show you. I have it on my computer, and I can click the Windows thingy down here, and there's the button to open it up. Um, and if you were to do that, then you could make videos when you're not online. So maybe you're like, I don't know, away from home or away from your office and you want to make the video, you would just have to, of course, save it on your computer because you're not online. Um, so we're, we're not going to mess with that today, but um, you can go ahead and instead you could just click launch free recorder. The first time you do that, it's going to download a small exe file. So that's the same as, you know, if you install a Chrome extension or something like that, it's not a full program. It's a real quick and small file. You run that file and then you come back here and press launch for recorder again and it will actually launch. So I'm gonna do that. And you see on this dotted line, outline, that's your recording area. As it's telling us, recorder will record anything that happens in this frame. You're gonna to wanna to adjust the size of it probably. Um, also, this is when you can open up whatever else it is you want to record. So you probably don't want to record the Screencast-O-Matic homepage. Um, so if you're giving feedback on a paper, go ahead and bring up that paper. Um, I'm going to actually, let's see, let's, I'll open a new tab and put in, um, well, let's just leave the, the Google search bar. So I can drag the, um, the corners of this box and change my recording area. Um, say, okay, I want to record this area right here. Um, so now we're ready to record. We press the record button. And as the next uh, slide tells you, you're going to see that count on you just saw three, two, one, go. Um, so we're, we're recording now. You can see the countdown going right here, or the count up. It's counting up to a maximum of 15 minutes, and we're recording. Let's say we decide to search for, um, let's see. I live in Ellicott City. Search for the Ellicott City flooding. Um, and so you could do whatever it is. You could, you know, whatever I'm doing is being recorded inside this box. Um, it's also recording my speech right now. So everything I'm saying to you is part of this recording. And um, when I'm done, I need to stop the recording and save it. The way you do that in Screencast-O-Matic, the first step to stop the recording is actually to press pause. And from here, you can truly stop the recording by pressing done. You have a few other options here. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide because we're actually on the last step. You have a few other options here. Um, if you want to resume the recording, you can press record again. So maybe you need to go like refill your coffee and then finish your recording. You could do that. Um, or you could trash the recording and start all over. Um, if you 
decide that you messed up badly enough, um, but I'm not gonna do that. If we're done, we're just gonna press done. And you get a few options for saving that recording. Um, the bottom option here, editing the video, is only going to work for paid accounts, so we don't need to worry about that. The easiest option is going to be quick share, and I'll show, that's the one I'm going to ultimately click and show you in a moment. Click share is going to just immediately start uploading your recording to your Screencast-O-Matic account, and then it's going to copy the um, link to that recording to your clipboard. Um, the recording will be named with a number. It's going to be like a recording one, I guess, if it's your first recording, but you could always go into your account and rename it. Um, the top option, save and upload, gives you a few more steps. Um, it allows you, for example, to give your recording a name right then and there, and allows you to choose a few different um, options for it. And so um, it just has a little bit more steps, but it gives you a little bit more functionality. And that's also the one you would choose if you wanted to save the recording to your computer. So it gives you the option to save it to your computer or to upload it to various sites, um, including the Screencast-O-Matic site, directly to YouTube, which you would probably have, I think you have to set up some special enabling permissions to do that, um, to Google Drive. So more options. But let's um, try quick share because I want to show you just the easiest option. So you can see when I click that, that up here in the right hand, top right hand part of the corner, it's uploading. Um, going pretty quickly and it says already the link is copied to my clipboard so it's already copied even though I hadn't even finished um, uploading and um, now it's done if I for some reason lost that link off my clipboard I could click here and copy it again and so I'm going to show you um, if I if I go and paste that paste what's in my clipboard into the um, address bar. Here's that recording. That's the recording of my screen from you know, the Google homepage. And if I click play, it's going to play. The slide tells you, you're going to see that countdown. You just saw three, two, one, go. So you heard you know, everything I was just uh, telling you when, when we made that sample recording. So there it is. If you go back to your Screencast-O-Matic account now, it's going to be there. Um, oh, where'd that go? So if I click my videos at this point, this is recording number 539 and it's here. And so if I, for whatever reason, lost it, needed to come back and access it, I can come back here, I can copy the link to it, I can rename it, I can change various settings on it. Um, and so that's where it is. And I am we going to- We do have to... a, a couple little um, questions if you have a, a second, Sarah. Yes, sure. Um, and I'm gonna be going back chronologically. Would this be savable to OneDrive? I don't see why not. Okay, that was the one question. Um, the other one, uh, a quick question from Kathy that said, asked what the webcam button was for. That was when you first started ah, the demonstration. Yeah. Um, so that's going to give you the option to um, to to include the um, your own video, your webcam video, in a little inset. So um, you actually can choose any combination with Screencast-O-Matic. You could record just your screen. You could record just your webcam video. So if you just want a video of your face or you know your talking head um talking to your your viewer or you could have your um screen with an inset of your webcam so you have all three of those options Got it. um and then one other question for now which is uh what do you think of using youtube as your video repository and i did put in the comments that's exactly what maryland online does for free um I wanted to know your thoughts. Yeah, um, I do like using YouTube because um, similar to having the automatic transcript on Zoom, YouTube will create auto captions. So um, if you upload a video to YouTube, it takes a while, maybe a couple hours, but when you come back, there's going to be automatic captions that have been generated. They do have to be edited to be decent, 
But, um, you know, if it's something where you really want closed captions, then I find that to be, for me, the easiest way to do it. Um, what I would be really careful about, and this is something I was going to mention later, but since it's come up, I'm going to mention it now. What I'd be really careful about is um, if you are using, um, if you're using that screencast to give students feedback on their papers, then you want to make sure that that is not a public YouTube video because we have to um, be careful about privacy concerns. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. And then there is actually one that was a little bit earlier and someone asked about whether you could caption with Screencast-O-Matic. And I apologize if you answered that, the question was asked from before. Um, it may be in the paid version. I don't believe it's available in the free version. And so um, let, let me come back. I'm, I'll say a little bit more about captions because there's a slide to that. <laughs> Anything else now? That, that, that should be it for now. Okay. All right, so I'm going to uh, mention a few tips for um, making the screencast videos. One, I would suggest that you address the student by name if you're giving a feedback to an individual student. You heard me do that in the sample feedback video that I played. Um, and in fact, I said, hi, I hope you're doing well. So um, I, I think it's nice to start off like that. You know, I, I don't remember who I heard say this initially, but I heard somebody say once, it's good to start off by acknowledging our shared humanity, right? Like, <laughs> say some, say a greeting, be friendly, you know, that the way you would when you speak to somebody. Um, you already heard me also say that I think it's helpful to use notes. Um, and if it's, depending on how polished I need that video to be, I will do more or less planning, right? If it's something where, you know, somebody asks me, how do you do such and such, and, and I'm making a quick technical video, I don't need to plan for that because I know how to do that task. Um, if it's feedback to a student, maybe I have some notes that I work off of. And if it's something that I know is going to, a video that I know is going to last for a long time and be seen by a lot of people, I might even have a script um, because that will help me um, stay on track and also it could be the beginning of a transcript. Um, as far as video feedback, as in any type of feedback, I think it's really important to prioritize. Um, as I mentioned, we sometimes have this tendency to, um, we want to make sure students know everything we have to say and justify everything we've done in a grade or anything like that. And I would suggest that we try to resist that tendency. Um, there is a cognitive load factor here, meaning that when you tell students everything, their brains get so busy that they don't absorb anything. So um, we want to think about what are the most important things to tell them. I do think for the best audio quality, you want to try to use a microphone. Um, depending on your um, conditions and your computer and all of that, it may not be necessary, but I find it helpful. Um, and I just use, like you can see right here, this is my, these are phone earbuds and works fine for me. And then those were a bunch of do's. The, the don't I would suggest is don't try to um, be perfect in the videos, especially if this is something you're doing for um, feedback to a whole class of students. You want these to be quick, right? You want to be able to make that video in five minutes and send it off and go to the next one. Nobody will complain if you say um or oh or make a mistake or backtrack. This happens all the time. And so if you feel a tendency to like need to start over for, for a small mistake, just try to override that so that you can keep going and get it done. And then a couple of concerns that have come up already and they are definitely valid concerns. Accessibility. Um, we want to make sure that we're meeting whatever um, accessibility needs that exist and that are required as well. Um, I know that in um, UMGC, the general policy is if you're posting a video for your entire class, it's sitting there in your online classroom for the whole class to see, it must meet all accessibility requirements. It must have a transcript or closed captioning. If you are giving a video to an individual student, you know, so for example, for video feedback, then you don't need those features unless you have been made aware that this student requires them. 
So um, there is a distinction there between something you do for an individual student and something you give to the whole class. And that's really fortunate because if you had to create a transcript for every bit of video, video feedback you did, you probably would never do it at all. Um, so make so you can check with your own school what the requirements are, but um, that's the guideline that I am familiar with. And then privacy, that also had come up already. So you wanna make sure that um, wherever you are posting or making these videos available, if they contain student names and student work, that they are not accessible to other people. Um, in YouTube, you can set the video as um, only accessible to people with the link. So that would, that would accomplish that. And then you share the link only to that individual student. Or in Screencast-O-Matic, that's going to be private by default. Um, as long as you're not, you know, grouping the videos together into folders where everyone can see them or something like that. Um, Sarah, before you move on, there were two questions, additional questions about privacy. And one is, if you're using the student's name, do you need to request permission to give the video or, or use this video feedback? And then the second one was interesting, and that was, do any of the faculty do, uh, have concerns about privacy in the sense the students might share their feedback to, with other students. Ah, okay, so the first one, if you're using, I'm not sure about that first question, if it was asking about sharing the students' feedback with other people. Um, I I've, never, I've never found it necessary to ask a student for permission to give them video feedback, if that's the, if that's the question, but I'm not sure if I'm understanding it right. Yeah, maybe we can have it. I think that that, yeah, I guess just because it's using the student, but I guess if it's just directly with the student, it shouldn't be an issue. I guess it's about being recorded, but. Um. Right, and I would not share that video with um, other people, you know, in a private meeting of my department or something. There's been times when that's happened, but you know, that's, you know, a private controlled environment. But in something like this, as I mentioned, like the video feedback that I showed was not a real student and it was not a real student paper. I made all that up. Um, and then, can you remind me what the second question was? Oh, if, if the faculty have privacy concerns about students sharing the feedback with other students? Um, no, I mean, I, I guess my thought would be that's the student's prerogative to share their feedback with another student if they wanted to. And, you know, as a faculty member, if you, if you didn't want that to get out, you know, if you felt like that was something other people shouldn't watch, then, then, you know, it might, might not be the best type of feedback um, method for you. Because I think it is a possibility, you know, once you hand that to the student, they can do whatever they want with it. Anything else? Um, uh, May asked if you can, if you put restrictions, can you put restrictions on the video so they actually can't be shared by anyone, just viewed? Um, and that um, might be getting into the technical of what platform you're using to share them. Right, I think so. So like, if you were to put the video on YouTube, rather than having it um, so that anyone with the link could share it, you could give permission to specific people, I believe. Um, so yeah, it might be a possibility. Thank you, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just um, give you a few suggestions for um, if you would like to start doing video feedback or screencasts of, other, of some other type, some um, concerns that you could consider in developing a plan for yourself to make sure that you can accomplish this and it doesn't just remain a, an abstract goal. Um, so one thing I think you should do is choose a specific class and assignment where you think screencast feedback would be useful. Um, if, you, if you think, all right, I'm just gonna start doing this and it's gonna be all my classes and all my assignments, that's probably too much as a starting point and you don't wanna be overwhelmed. Um, so choose a starting point, a class and an assignment um, and go with that. Similarly, decide how many students you're gonna start with. Um, you know, if, if you have a large class and you know that you know doing this for 30 students in the next week is going to be too much for you go for a limited release make it a pilot <laughs> a pilot program for yourself right um decide how many you can accomplish in your first go around and go with that because remember you know give yourself a break you 
everybody has a learning curve doing something for the first time. And so it's going to take longer the first time. Um, it might take longer the first few times. And that gives you some time to you know, develop your routine, learn how to do it. And I think sooner, pretty soon you would find that it was, it's more reasonable to extend that to the whole class. And then think about how you're going to gauge success. So what is it that you're hoping to accomplish with doing the video feedback and or whatever it is you're doing with your video? And how will you know if it's working? So do you wanna ask students their opinion of it? Do you want to just look at the stats and make sure they watched it? Um, so just, I think that's something to, good to have in mind. Like, how do I feel comfortable knowing that what I'm doing is worthwhile or knowing that there's some adjustment that I'm gonna to wanna to make? And that is uh, the conclusion of my prepared remarks. So let me um, see if there's any other questions or comments. I, we don't have, a, I don't think, a lot of new ones. I hope, hope I didn't miss any. Um, but it, again, this group has been great because a lot of people are sharing resources and answers and uh, give a very um, rich uh, chat box going on. And I think for the first time, I don't, I don't, I've never done this before, I am going to, I think, try to uh, include the um, chat discussion. If I can't actually get a transcript that looks good, that has all the resources in it, I may just pull the individual resources and suggestions and things and try to put them into a document form to include with the resources we send out. Um, we do have one quick question about Camtasia. Do you have any knowledge of Camtasia? Um, well, so as I mentioned, I, I am not a Camtasia user because it's not provides me and I am not investing the money in it. But, um, but I do know that it is very nice for um, editing. So, you know, if you are trying to um, show things on your screen and you want to blow up a section or you want to do some advanced markup on the screen, um, you want to uh, splice together different parts of a video or blur things out, like all of those things I believe should be possible in Camtasia. Well, I think that's just about it. We're getting close to the end of time. Um, you're going, not end of time, but end of this webinar time. Um, I did want to mention one thing and that is for those of you who are very interested, but you feel like maybe this was a little, you know, a little bit overwhelming or a lot of information. Sarah did another video for us, another webinar for us, and it was, it, we paused so people could try the tool. Now we, we paused the video, so it's not like you're sitting there waiting for everyone to try the tool, but it might just, you know, sometimes it's good to just hear it from, you know, it's, it's still Sarah talking, but maybe um, a couple different things that might hit you differently. And that's gonna be on the Maryland Online YouTube channel, which I, Told you about in the chat and that's what we actually will give you uh so you'll be able to see all the videos we've, we've had but um but i say that for two reasons one you may be interested in watching that one and also i wanted to make sure that if you wanted to go back to this video and you went right to screencasting we date them just be aware that there's two sarah felber screencasting videos that will be on the youtube uh, channel so make sure if you want this particular one today that you, you pick the right one um and, yeah, those uh, again, are pretty much, I mean, they're almost the same mm -hmm. presentation. It was um, the same slides pretty much, but as Wendy mentioned, we had a pause for, at that time, for people to try things out. Actually, I, I think that in retrospect, it might be better to do it on your own time. So we went for that this, this go around. Yeah, yeah, just to play around with it and just give, you know, extra thing. I mean, this is, this has been excellent. You're getting a ton of compliments in the <laughs> chat, Sarah. Um, it is, she's, Again, we had a, a wealth of resources um, that you just covered and that I, I just want to thank you again. And I want to thank everyone for um, sharing all their, uh, their resources. And we will get all of this information back out to you um, as, as soon as we can within the next day or two. So, any parting words, Sarah? Uh, just uh, thank you for being here. And you know what? I am going to put my email address in the chat because I didn't put it on the slide. Great. And so if anyone has anything they wanted to uh, contact me about, you can.
I was just going to mention, this is Mary Francis from Political Science. Um, I was just going to, hey, how you doing, Sarah? Um, <laughs> we see each other often when we don't have coronavirus running around. Um, but I was just going to mention, if you are thinking about Camtasia, please be aware it's very expensive. There is a free trial, but the lowest educator's price, I think, is 170 or 175 bucks. That's a lot for software. Yeah, yeah and you know, I, as I mentioned, I, I use Screencast-O-Matic because the um, free version is great. I've, so I've never even felt the need to invest the fifteen dollars in it, even though I, yeah, I could. But um, well, Camtasia's right, so, got a free trial, which is you know, if you want to go out there yeah. and goof around with it, that's great. But just be aware that you right. may fall in love and be one hundred and seventy <laughs> bucks poorer. So. You know, right. just a thought. It depends how what you're looking to do and how much money you're willing to put into it. Right. So true. I don't know if there's a cost to Loom. Um, Loom I is haven't, free. Yeah, um, I've never. Oh, Loom is free. Okay. I didn't know. They used to at one yeah. point only have free. Then I thought for a while they had an upgraded version that you could pay for. Mm -hmm. But it was still reasonable. It was under $40. Yeah. And so yeah, I mentioned Loom changes their model quite a lot. The latest yeah. I heard was that the um, there's more features that are free for educators um, than for the general accounts. So that may be a good option. Oh, that's good. Well, thank thank you again, Sarah. And um, if you have questions, uh, and and if you you don't see Sarah Sarah did put her email in there, but you can also through Kathleen or myself, um, you know, if you need to if you want to get some information or questions, we'll we'll pass them along to Sarah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone, and we'll send out information soon. Thank you again, Sarah. My pleasure.